If you're a Palestinian in exile, if you're a Palestinian in the diaspora, and you grew up in early 2000s, your family had Al Jazeera on 24-7 and was watching live footage from the second Intifa. And you were rooting for The Rock like you were watching wrestling. At the labor conference, they backed a motion urging the party to back sanctions against Israel for its illegal actions under international law. And they basically say that action is now needed, that labor should adhere to an ethical policy on all UK trade with Israel, including stopping any arms trade used to violate Palestinian human rights and trade with illegal Israeli settlements. What I like about this is that they have tied very clearly their need to act being an ethical position. And I hope that this can be an example for politicians in the U.S. Yeah, but didn't you see AOC cried? So that's pretty good. <laughs> hey, if you haven't stabbed a goat, are you even interested in peace? This is the Palestine part. Palestine part. Hello and welcome to episode 26 of the Palestine Pod, the weekly podcast where we break down the latest headlines dealing with Palestine from all over the world and bring you stories, commentary, and interviews with the aim of supporting the Palestinian struggle for justice and equal rights. I'm one of your hosts, Lara E. You might know me from Instagram as at Gazan Girl, and I'm joined by my co-host, Mikey B. What's up, y'all? Mikey B on TikTok, Michael Scherzer on Instagram. And you can call me Mikey Intifada if Grandpa Yaakov Sharet telling you to get the fuck out of Palestine makes you mad, but you spend all day online telling Palestinians to get over it. Love it. Absolutely love it. And for those of you who, who didn't catch that reference, go to Michael's Instagram and check out one of the latest videos that he posted. Absolutely magnificent. Thank so you so much. So before we get into today's episode, please like, comment, and subscribe if you hang out with us on YouTube. And if you're listening on a podcast app, subscribe and leave a review. As always, you can find our full episodes and sources on palestinepod.com. And if you want to get involved in the conversation, feel free to reach out to us at palestinepod at gmail.com. Give us a follow on Instagram at the Palestine Pod, and feel free to subscribe to our Patreon, where every week we are adding more and more exclusive content a few solo pods and some additional Michael and I pods and whatever else we come up with. So feel free to join our Patreon. We would love to see you over there. At the labor conference, they backed a motion urging the party to back sanctions against Israel for its illegal actions under international law, also to stop the UK arms trade with Israel, and also to end trade with illegal settlements on occupied Palestinian territory. There's also a statement supporting the Palestinian right to return included in this statement. And of course, there were high up individuals within the Labour Party that were like, we can't support this motion. Some names include the Labour's shadow foreign minister, Lisa Nandy, and then also, of course, Labour Party leader, Keir Starmer. But I think it's worth it for us to take a look at the actual wording of the motion, because it's some very strong wording to come out of a very prominent political party in the UK. So the motion that was passed on Monday at the Labour's conference in Brighton essentially opens with a condemnation of the ongoing Nakba in Palestine. And they actually use the Arabic word Nakba, which, of course, if you've been listening to our pod since the beginning, you know, refers to the catastrophe in Arabic, the historical event which began around 1948, but has yet to cease because we're living in an ongoing Nakba. It essentially refers to the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, the forced removal of Palestinians from their homeland and their replacement with foreign settlers, which is essentially the Zionist project. So they open with this, you know, condemnation of the ongoing Nakba in Palestine, Israel's militarized violence attacking Al-Aqsa, and the forced displacements from Sheikh Jarrah, as well as the deadly assault on Gaza. They refer to the de facto annexation of Palestinian land, which has been accelerated by settlement building. And they also refer to Israel's intention to proceed with annexation. Remember that whole big debacle that was, you know, in the news all over the place last year, but then it sort of just kind of went quiet. We stopped talking about it, even though the reality on the ground didn't change. The motion says it's even clearer that Israel is intent on eliminating any prospects of Palestinian self-determination in light of the settlement building and their stated intention to proceed with annexation. 
The motion also refers to the 2021 reports of Beit Salem and Human Rights Watch, which conclude that Israel is practicing the crime of apartheid as defined by the UN. Now, this is super important because we've covered those reports as well. So a lot of times people will ask, okay, so what good is it that human rights organizations are issuing these reports that are coming out with findings of apartheid or findings of, you know, violations of international law on behalf of Israel when Israel remains unaccountable under international law and Israeli impunity is what reigns. And I think this is a clear instance of a way in which report by an NGO that that contains findings of human rights violations can be used in the political process to actually impact change. So they have referred to those reports, citing very clearly that those reports conclude that Israel is practicing the crime of apartheid. They also make a reference to the ICC decision to hold an inquiry into the abuses committed in Palestine since 2014. And they basically say that action is now needed due to Israel's continuing illegal actions and that labor should adhere to an ethical policy on all UK trade with Israel, including stopping any arms trade used to violate Palestinian human rights and trade with illegal Israeli settlements. What I like about this is that they have tied very clearly their need to act to being an ethical position. They are very clearly seeing the importance, the that time is of the essence, that 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 right now they are part of history. And if they don't act, they'll be on the wrong side of history. Right. So the fact that they see this as an ethical issue, I think is very important. And the resolution ends by saying that they are calling for sanctions, they are opposing the building of settlements, they call on Israel to reverse any annexation and the occupation of the West Bank, the blockade of Gaza, bring down the wall which has been deemed illegal by the International Court of Justice and respect the rights of the Palestinian people as enshrined in international law to return to their homes. The final sentence of the motion, I think, is really incredible because they basically say that the Labour Party must stand on the right side of history and abide by these resolutions in its policy, communications, and political strategy. It's an excellently worded statement. There are so many nuggets in there. And I think that we really need to hold space for the fact that this was able to come out out of a prominent political party in the UK. And I hope, I hope that this can be an example for politicians in the US who unfortunately are very far behind their UK counterparts. Yeah, but didn't you see AOC cried? So that's pretty good. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, not only did she cry, but then she came out with her non-apology apology. apology. Did you see that? Yeah, four pages. It took four pages to say nothing. We still don't know why she changed her vote. If anything, she made a compelling argument for why she should have voted no, probably. No, she doesn't explain anything. She's like, I am issuing this statement to explain what went on. And then she doesn't explain anything. So I, I still have just a bunch of question marks in my head. Yeah, I actually read this statement and woke up hypnotized with my liver missing. It was weird. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I think you haven't. You've like a is, wait liver. You have one of those, right? That's the one where you only have yeah, one. Yeah, just just one. The one. Yeah, it was it, it was tough. I had to get so it back. You, one of the prominent Palestinian activists from on the ground, Isa Amro, who's actually a friend of mine, was speaking at a labor event on Tuesday via video link, and basically said that. This was a huge, huge victory. And although the Labour Party has long wanted to destroy the Palestinian point of view, yesterday we won. We love Jeremy Corbyn, but we did it without Jeremy Corbyn with our supporters in the Labour Party. But of course, I think he really paved the way and we need to create some space for that acknowledgement as well. Jeremy Corbyn was sacrificed so that this, this statement could pass. So let's remember this summer when Israel was committing genocide in Gaza, Uh, attacking Al-Aqsa Mosque and carrying out brutal arrests and attacks on Palestinians resisting its colonial policy in 48 and the occupied West Bank, you had 200,000 people show up in London for a protest, which was the greatest number in recent history. So I think it's interesting to note that we are seeing this shift also after a mass mobilization of the grassroots. Right. And it comes around the same time as the anniversary of the Second Intifada, right? In 2000, on September 28, the criminal aerial Sharon 
stormed the courtyards of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the second intifada erupted as a result. The intifada lasted more than four years, during which 4,442 Palestinians were martyred. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, although the second intifada was this period of uprising to colonial violence that was sustained for uh, around five years, we lost so many people. Like you said, almost 5,000 people um, were martyred. We had almost 40,000 Palestinians that were wounded. We had 10,000 Palestinians that were detained in that time. The 2000 Camp David Summit is a central piece of that situation because what happened was during the meeting at Camp David between then President Bill Clinton, Israeli PM Ehud Barak, and PA Chairman Yasser Arafat, they discussed a number of things but were unable to come to a agreement because the Israeli position was such that it would essentially retain control over all settlements with major populations. And Palestinians had already made a territorial compromise by accepting Israel's 78% of historic Palestine with their state on the remaining 22%, right? This consensus was expressed by Faisal Husseini when he remarked, there can be no compromise on the compromise. One of the grounds of rejection was that the Israeli proposal planned to annex areas which would lead to the cantonization of the West Bank into three blocks, which the Palestinian delegation likened to South African Bantu stance. A word that was disputed and called loaded by the Israeli and American negotiators. Well, we've since seen that very thing happen and had Nkosi Mandela on to confirm that the language is accurate. The Israelis also wanted control over the Temple Mount, including the Al-Aqsa compound, as well as the Dome of the Rock, Palestinian airspace, and all water. The Israeli negotiators proposed that Israel be allowed to set up radar stations inside a Palestinian state. They wanted the right to deploy troops into Palestinian territory and wanted to station an international force in the Jordan Valley. Well, they've already since gobbled up the Jordan Valley, right? Palestinian authorities would maintain control over border crossings under temporary Israeli observation. Israel would maintain a permanent security presence along 15% of the Palestinian Jordan border. They also, the Zionists also demanded that the Palestinian state be demilitarized, right? That it would not make alliances without Israel's approval and would allow introduction of foreign forces west of the Jordan River. As for the right of return, According to U.S. Secretary of State at the time, Madeleine Albright, allegedly some Palestinian negotiators were willing to privately discuss a limit on the number of refugees who would be allowed to return. Palestinians who choose to return would do so gradually, with Israel absorbing 150,000 refugees every year. The Israeli negotiators denied that Israel was responsible for the refugee problem and were concerned that any right of return would pose a threat to Israel's Jewish character. In the proposal, a maximum of 100,000 refugees would be allowed to return on the basis of humanitarian considerations or family reunification. Meanwhile, anybody from anywhere in the United States who is Jewish or anywhere in the world can go and get citizenship right now. Everybody knows somebody that was arrested during the second intifada. Everybody knows somebody that, you know, had their house raided by the occupation forces or was, you know, wounded or whatever it may be. But, you know, watching the scenes of the second intifada unfold from my TV screen when I was just a young kid in the U.S., because we'd have it on TV every day, you know, like that's what we would watch all day long. If you're a Palestinian in exile, if you're a Palestinian in the diaspora, and you grew up in that time, you know, in like the early 2000s, your family had Al Jazeera or one of the other Arabic stations on 24-7 and was watching live footage from the second intifada. 
and you were rooting for the rock like you were watching wrestling the rock yeah the rocks being thrown at the israelis oh the rocks okay sorry a bit slow today yeah, and I'll, I mean, I'll never forget. I'll never forget the, the, the video of Mohammed al Dura and his father being executed by occupation forces. It played over and over and over again. I'll never forget the, the sheer terror and fear in both of their eyes. I'll never forget seeing the lifeless body, you know, pushed up against the wall, the father trying to shield his son. And, and these are the images of the Second Intifada, you know, the, the images that are seared into our memory and are the reason for which we will never stop resisting and we'll never stop talking and we'll never stop fighting and we'll never stop doing anything we can to make it very clear that colonial violence is not a status quo that we are willing to accept. And I think when you see exactly like you just described the concessions that Palestinian leadership has made over the years, it shows very clearly that Israel's not interested in any sort of a, an agreement with Palestinians where we would live side by side, you know, in, in two states, right? They're not interested in it at all because when we say, okay, we'll give you, you can have the majority of our land, just leave us be. We'll, we'll just take this tiny little bit and we'll just stay here, even though you're literally living on the majority of our land. And we accept the deal never goes through because then they'll say, oh, no, 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 but, but we can't, that's no, that it, it's not, it can't be just that, right? So there's always going to be, and, and you see it very clearly right now. Naftali Bennett says there will never be a Palestinian state. So thank you. Thank you very much for making very clear what the Zionist position has been all along. So now that we know that, why at the same time, is Joe Biden going before the UN General Assembly and talking about how I, you know, affirm my commitment for and support for the two-state solution. We need to have a two-state solution. And literally the leader of the apartheid state is saying there will never be a Palestinian state. So make it make sense. It's sort of like that old comedy routine where it's like, who's on first? What's on second? You know what I mean? It's just a bunch of gibberish that confuses people. It's all gibberish. None of it is, is rooted in logic. One guy's saying it'll never happen. And the other guy's saying we support that guy, but also we, 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 we got to make it happen. It's sort of like when I used to work in a restaurant and I would ask for time off and then my manager would be like, ask the owner, right? And the owner would be like, ask the manager. Yeah. And I would end up working. Yeah, you'd end up working all the shifts. And then they'd, they'd give you more shifts because you, you even and asked. Then, they didn't pay me and they stole my robe. It was fucked up. Yeah. One of the other stories that we are covering this week is the killing of five Palestinians by the occupation forces, which took place early on Sunday. Is this story, as it's being reported on by the mainstream media, which most of the time Palestinian deaths, killings, murders, assassinations are never even covered by the mainstream media. But when they are, you'll often see reference to the fact that we were just Hamas terrorists. And that's exactly how this was reported on in the news, when in reality, the people who were killed were young Palestinian youth, just like you or I, who have hopes and dreams, who were studying, who had plans to get married very soon, who had plans to do whatever it may be with their lives. And yet the New York Times, for example, has referred to them as Hamas operatives. It's a really unfortunate story because what we're seeing is retaliation, I think, aimed at the occupied city of Janin. Retaliation because, of course, we know that the escaped prisoners whose story we covered on our episode entitled The Great Escape were from the occupied village of Janin. And so the occupation forces are showing, okay, not only are we going to arrest and torture those escaped prisoners, but we're going to retaliate against the very village that they are from. And kill others from that village with absolutely no accountability. Doesn't matter who they are. Nobody's going to ask. Nobody's going to do an investigation. You know, the Palestinian leadership will just 
issue a statement saying, oh, solace to the families. I think that's exactly what the Palestinian Prime Minister Hamed Shteya has, has said, patience and solace to the families and freedom to our people from this criminal occupation and its continuous violations of our people, which is great, but stop working with them. Patience? Yeah, I don't know. How much more patience can we have? I mean, we've been we've been occupied and ethnically cleansed for almost a hundred years now. I feel like if you're gonna levy critiques at Palestinians, a lack of patience is not one of them that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. I think if anything, Palestinians are too patient. A little bit. I do I do agree with that. One of the individuals who was killed was a full-time employee at the Palestinian Museum in Birzeit near Ramallah, which I visited when I was in Palestine. So can you imagine, like, you murdered a docent at a museum. Like, you murdered the guy who stands there and makes sure that you don't touch the art. So three of the Palestinians actually hailed from the village of Biddu, which is near Jerusalem, they were Ahmed Zahran, Mahmoud Hamedan, and Zakaria Badwan. And two of the Palestinians were from Jenin, and they are Osama Saboh and 16 year old Yusuf Saboh. So, some really young children who, again, are being referred to as Hamas operatives by the mainstream media. Yeah. And Beth Salem captured tens of Israeli settlers attacking Palestinians in the South Hebron Hills. They entered homes, smashed windows, destroyed cars and water tanks, threw rocks at a car and fractured the skull of a three-year-old boy who was in the car. On the Jewish holiday of Simcha Torah, which literally means rejoicing of the Torah, and is meant to be one of the most joyous days in the Jewish calendar, a pogrom took place in the South Hebron Hills. Dozens of masked settlers set out from the settlements and attacked residents of the nearby Kerbet al Mufakara, escorted by Israeli security forces. They invaded Palestinian homes, smashed windows, and caused massive damage to equipment. They also attacked three-year-old Mohammed Bakar Hussein, who, according to his family, suffers from a fractured skull and is currently hospitalized. How did it all begin? Around 2 p.m., several settlers from Avagail attacked a Palestinian shepherd, a resident of Kirbit Arakiz, while he was grazing his flock about 200 meters away from the settlement and tried unsuccessfully to steal his flock which was returned to him by women and residents who had gathered to retrieve it. However, settlers did manage to slaughter four of his goats. During that afternoon and evening, border officers and soldiers who were present at the violent incidents arrested one of the Palestinian residents and covered for the marauding settlers by firing tear gas canisters at residents trying to defend themselves and their property. In the recent months, state-backed settler violence has been raging in the South Hebron Hills. And that, that is a Twitter thread. Yeah, what is more Jewish than attacking a shepherd on his land and on a Jewish holiday on a Jewish holiday. And I've seen the pictures of the three-year-old boy. His head is completely smashed in. There's blood everywhere. It's not a pretty sight. And he's on a ventilator right now in a hospital. You can see the photos for yourself. Just Google Mohammed Bakr Hussein. You'll, you'll find it. And the notion yeah. that this was the Zionist way to celebrate a holy day in Judaism is absolutely insane it's insane what are you supposed to do what are you supposed to do on that day you're supposed to like celebrate by hugging the torah and like dancing around and being jovial and enjoying positivity right you're not supposed to be destroying the skull of a child because you are enacting colonial state violence that's not that's not in the book, fam. That's not how we do it. Not in the book. Go back to the source. Y'all are really bugging. 
I've got a story about an Israeli diplomat who pressured the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, to remove a teacher who criticized Israel on mm-hmm. Twitter. Shout out Dr. Steve Salida. They accused her of anti-Semitism and claimed that she's not fit to teach the course on Palestine. This was all reported in The Intercept. This is a blatant foreign interference in U.S. academia reinforced by a member of U.S. Congress and granted audience to by the university itself. The Israeli government attempted to prevent Kylie Broderick from teaching her course on quote, the conflict over Israel and Palestine is alarming, even by the standard of censorship and repression around Palestine on campuses, a standard set by firings of professors, cancellations of webinars, prosecutions of students, and the maintenance of public blacklists. Once again, we see false accusations of anti-Semitism and the false equation of Zionist and Jew used to help the Israeli government avoid accountability for its oppression of Palestinians. This is a statement written by Jewish Voices for Peace. Her response is actually quite brilliant. The controversy started over several tweets sent by Broderick that were highly critical of the United States and U.S. foreign policy, including support for BDS. Broderick rejected accusations leveled by Israeli consular officials that her criticisms of Israel on social media constitute anti-Semitism. A critique of Israel and the political ideology of Zionism does not constitute bigotry, Broderick said. States are not religions, nor are states people. I think that a representative of a foreign government attempting to police an academic class is, in the first place, ridiculous and an obvious overreaction to what is essentially an issue that started on Twitter, Broderick said. I also think it's strange that the Israeli consulate general was granted an audience if this was a class on Hungary or Australia. Would the university have permitted the attempted interference of a foreign government? The fact that this meeting happened at all is a clear threat to academic freedom. Handled like a G. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, shout out to all the professors that are actually trying to teach their students at universities all across the U.S. about history and colonialism and apartheid and genocide and are consistently being prevented from doing so by the intervention of the very actors who are committing the genocide, the apartheid, and the settler colonialism. I mean. Yeah. And shout out to the, all the intelligence agents who are freaking out over academic freedom. Yeah. Because God forbid, Michael, they, the students find out what's actually going on. They might, you know, try to just get up and free Palestine. That's their fear. Is that people find out that's it. Look, I want you to try to find an article about Palestinians trying to censor Israelis, right? We don't do it. We don't do it. We don't sit here and try to censor Zionist propaganda that is being spewed in our universities. That's how it's always been. It doesn't fucking matter because it's not the truth. So we don't care, right? We'll go, we'll show up to your weird event with like an Israeli ambassador and we'll protest. That's different. Right. Because we are making our side of the story known and we have a we have a legitimate grievance that we need to make in front of an individual who is a war criminal. That's different. But what these Zionists are doing are saying, no, no, you can't teach what what happened back then, because that's going to be a problem. That's anti-Semitism, you know. That's a little bit different than what I'm talking about. And the only people doing this are Zionists because they are scared in their boots that people might actually find out how their state was born. They're like, you can't have the event at all. And you're an anti-Semite. And it's like, I'm Jewish and accredited as a professor. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy that the anti-Semitism line has gotten them this far. To be really honest, because I would love to see just people. I mean, imagine, imagine just trying to justify apartheid and settler colonialism by saying you're an Islamophobe, right? That would never work. That would never work. Like you would never get far with that. Nobody cares if you're an Islamophobe. 
It's like cool to be an Islamophobe. They'd be like, we've got a job for you at the FBI, actually. <laughs> right. They'd be like, you're hired. Yeah. You start tomorrow. No background check. <laughs> nope. Nope. But like the fact that you can say you're an anti-Semite and then the result is that your classes get blocked, your events get canceled, you know, you're, yeah. you get fired, all this stuff. And it's like, if the very same accusation were made against another minority faith group in the United States, the result would not be the same. Not at all. And it's crazy because they admitted that it's just a trick that they use, right? Yes. Remember that Israeli yeah. official yep. who went on Amy Goodman's Democracy Now!, and she was just like, anti-Semitism, it's a trick that we use, right? Yeah. Um, often when there is dissent expressed in the United States against policies of the Israeli government, um, uh, people here are called anti-Semitic. Uh, what is your response to that as an Israeli Jew? Well, it's a trick. We always use it. When from Europe somebody is criticizing Israel, then we bring up the Holocaust. When in this country people are criticizing Israel, then they are anti-Semitic. And the organization is strong and has a lot of money. And the, the ties between uh, Israel and the American esta Jewish establishment are very strong. And they are strong in this country. As you know, uh, they have power, which it's okay, they are talented people and they have power, money and uh, media and other things and their attitude is Israel, my country, right or wrong, the identification and they are not ready to hear criticism and it's very easy to blame people who criticize certain acts of the Israeli government as anti-Semitics and to bring up the Holocaust and the suffering of the Jewish people and that's, that justify everything we do to the Palestinians. In the United States, if they say anything about Israel, then we say that they're anti-Semitic and then if they're from Europe, then we bring up the Holocaust. She's like, it's a trick that we use and it justifies everything we do for the Palestinians. I will cut it and put it, it's, her name is Shulamit Aloni. Yep. And she used to work for the Israeli apartheid regime. Just a little trick. Just a little trick Just they use. A little trick. Hey, and it is Halloween season. You know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah. trick or treat. Ooh, what are you going to be for Halloween this year, Michael? Ooh, this year I'm going to be a straight white male. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to talk a little bit about the UN General Assembly because I've been following a little bit of speeches and we all heard that Mahmoud Abbas came out with what some are characterizing as an ultimatum, a threat, um, call it what you will. But he basically told the occupation that if you don't end your occupation within one year, he basically gave the apartheid state one year to withdraw to the 1967 lines that if they do not do so, the Palestinian leadership will reverse its recognition of Israel and press for further charges to be made at the International Court of Justice if demands are not met. See, that's what I'm talking about when I say a little too patient, right? Giving them a full year. It's been 70 plus. Like, what are we doing? I don't know. This is, I it mean, should be. It should be get the fuck out yesterday, like a year. It should be like this should have never happened. And you owe us billions in reparations and yeah. goodbye. But he's like, y'all got a year. So take your time. You know, you can yeah. ease into it. <laughs> it's like, you know, like some sort. I don't know. I have no idea what he's thinking, but it's crazy because this is like actually one of the most serious statements that Mahmoud Abbas has made in a long time. Right. This is this caught the attention of everyone. People are saying, oh, this is different. He's given him a year. And, you know, my reaction to this. Of, OK, first I laughed. But then second, I was like, is he even going to remember in a year that he even said this? Yeah. In a year when he postpones elections again. He'll be like, wait, I said that. And of course, the PLO recognized the 1967 borders as a part of the Oslo peace process in the 90s. He basically said, if they don't withdraw, why maintain recognition of Israel based on the 1967 borders? Which, again, I fully agree with. But hey, bro, it's been since Oslo. 
that you guys accepted and Israel has done what? Build more settlements, steal more land, kill more Palestinians, and commit genocide of Gaza every couple of years, aka mowing the lawn. That's what they call it. Hey, but give them a year. Give them another year. I mean, like, that's like the least threatening thing. Can you imagine? You're like, you guys have a full yeah. year. And if you don't. Someone breaks into your house, <laughs> right? Holds you at gunpoint. Yeah. And then you're like, hey, you have a year to get out of here. <laughs> He's like already moved in. He's like already changed his like name on year. the mailbox. What, you... <laughs> what the hell? He's like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> He's like, okay, all right. It's like now you're duct taped in the corner and it's like, hey, six more months. <laughs> it's like the least threatening thing you could do. Yeah. But I do think it's interesting because one thing that he did say was, you know, okay, if you, if you don't leave in a year, we're going to go to the International Court of Justice to raise the issue of the legality of the occupation of the land of Palestine, which is an issue that... Mm -hmm. The ICJ has not dealt with, but of course has been dealt with in numerous UN resolutions and then other issues are being brought forth before the ICC, particularly with respect to the crimes that have been committed during the occupation. But I think it is interesting that he's raising now the issue of an ICJ proceeding into the legality of the occupation itself, which if there is an ICJ ruling that the occupation is legal, I think it'll be just yet another element in you know, the toolbox of decisions that are piling up against the apartheid state, which eventually are going to lead to this, you know, are going to become the straw that breaks the camel's back. So we'll see. Yes. We look forward to that long procedural process. <laughs> Check back with us in a year when we report. Actually, you know what? Let's set a timer for a year from now and be like, hey, it's been a year. Yeah, we'll, we'll remind a boss ourselves. <laughs> so what's crazy, of course, you have these totally delusional statements that are issued by the Zionists. So Israel's ambassador to the UN, Gilad Erdan, we've talked about him before on the pod, in response to Abbas's statement at the General Assembly has said, those who really support peace and negotiations don't issue threats and delusional ultimatums from the UN platform. Really? Isn't that what the UN is for? Yeah. <laughs> they <laughs> just bomb the Al Jazeera building, yep. as well as every center of commerce in Gaza. Those who support peace, they just murder a bunch of babies. That's what those and, who support peace do, right? And stab goats on a Jewish holiday. Hey, if you haven't stabbed a goat, are you even interested in peace? <laughs> That's got to be the intro for this week. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, Naftali Bennett comes out and says, I don't see any logic in meeting someone who is suing IDF soldiers at The Hague and accusing them of war crimes. OK, again, the entire Zionist premise is that Palestinians have to stop complaining about being murdered and expelled from their land and that their yeah. very legitimate grievance that they are being murdered and kicked off their land is insane. And the only way the Zionists will engage is if they just lay down and die. Right. So in order for us to engage with our colonizer, our colonizer accepts that we are defeated. Yeah. And then they steal your body and don't let your family bury you. So it's like, okay, so how does this work exactly? We lay down and die. And then what you show up to negotiations to say what, that you're dead already. So there's no point in negotiations. Is that how this works? They love negotiating with dead bodies. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the crazy thing is that's actually true. That's a big part of their negotiation strategy is like murder a bunch of people. And then that's the deal. Abbas also brought up the question of Palestinian textbooks, which are often cited by critics as inciting violence against Israeli civilians, which again, let's remind that there is no such thing as a civilian because it's a state filled with soldiers where almost all Israelis have at one point been in the military, are going to serve in the military, of course, with the exception of the refuseniks and those who have a religious exemption. So he goes on to say, we are made to explain and justify what appears in our educational materials, even though it explains our narrative and national identity. Meanwhile, no one demands to review Israeli curricula and media so the world can see the true incitement by Israeli institutions. This is actually a key point, and I'm going to give it to him here, because when we were in Palestine, I remember seeing a billboard that was in Hebrew 
within 48. And it was a, it was for some sort of a jam company. I don't, have I told this story before? I don't think so. Yeah. It was like for some sort of a jam company or like some butter or something. And it was like a mom and then like her soldier son in his like Ninja Turtle gear, you know, and his helmet and all this stuff. And I asked my Israeli American friend who was on the trip with me, amazing anti-Zionist, love her, shout out Karen, what this said. And she goes, it basically says that when her son goes out for a busy day of serving in the Israeli army. She always makes sure to feed him this brand of jam because she only trusts that jam to satisfy her son and protect him and keep him nourished while he's out serving. I hope his fucking gun jams. (laughs) Every aspect of their so-called national identity, every aspect of their so-called culture is about the military. It revolves around worshiping the military. Even something like eating breakfast goes back to how can this help the military, right? Yep. Grandpa Yakov said their national agenda is blood, death, and violence. Absolutely. Shout out Grandpa Yakov. Yeah. And shout out to the few refuseniks that were reported recently. They're becoming increasingly more popular among Israeli teens to not serve in the war crimes army. One thing that Abbas said during his speech that I actually really liked, which again, take it with a grain of salt because it's coming from the mouth of a collaborator, but it is a good line. He said, do Israeli rulers dream of maintaining the occupation forever? Are there not other options such as liberty, for example? And really like for me, this is actually a key point because what's the future for Israel? They're just going to keep murdering us and keep making the news and keep pretending that it's not apartheid and and keep calling for, you know, a two state solution while also separately saying that they will never have there will never be a two state solution. I mean, how does this end for them? Because we know how it ends for us. For us, it ends with liberation. We always talk about until liberation, until freedom. So we know where our narrative is going. But but what's their you know, best case scenario. I mean, is it just this maintenance of the status quo? Because what they think that they're going for is that at one point they will have murdered us all, gotten rid of us all and taken over everything, but that will never happen. And I think they're still in denial about that part because Palestinians are always going to resist. I'm so sorry to break it to you. Yeah. I was talking with a Jewish friend of mine, reasonable guy, and you know, not super Zionist or anything. He has friends who are Zionist and he was thinking of himself. He's talking to me. He's like, what is their end game? Like, what, what do they expect to happen? And the answer is they want to murder as many Palestinians as the world will let them get away with. They want to gobble up as much land as the international community will allow And they want to implement what's called the Greater Israel Plan, which means that they absorb the territory that's in their immediate vicinity. So that includes the part of Syria that's already being occupied. That includes the Jordan Valley, which has been gobbled up, the Golan Heights, etc. Right. And it also connects with U.S. imperialism abroad. The foreign intervention, the occupation of Iraq was lobbied by AIPAC as a part of the Greater Israel Strategy. It was the occupation of Afghanistan as well that is a part of the Greater Israel Strategy. They want to... They're going all the way to Afghanistan? They're trying to destroy the entirety of the Middle East so that they can weaken Iran as a regional power and then absorb literally everything. Like if you... There are TikTokers who talk about the Greater israel strategy and it's like they have a vision of like the ottoman empire but for zionists like zionists yeah and also to the point about education there's a video of children in the occupation being asked about the al-aqsa compound and they say that is the temple right that's the temple that needs to be rebuilt and they are teaching that to children then מי מאמין שבית המקדש ייבנה בשנים הקרובות? מה יש שם עכשיו על בית המקדש? אז מה יקרה עם המסגד? 
תשבר? אם היא כן פגש בשנה האחרונה ילד ערבי? איפה? איפה פגשת ילד ערבי? ליד הכותל. ודיברת איתו? לא, הוא דחף אותי, אבל לא עלה. ומה קורה כשאתם רואים ילד ערבי? מה אתם מרגישים? מגזם. מגזם? אהה. מגזם? מה קורה כשאתם פוגשים ילד חילוני? למה אתה מרחם עליו? למה אתה מרחם עליו? למה אתה מרחם עליו? מה הוא מפסיד? הוא לא הולך לדרך על הכל. כשאתם חושבים על ירושלים בעוד עשר שנים. כולם חרדים? כולם חרדים? לא כולם חרדים. חרדים חלק חרדים. כולם יהודים. יש גם ערבים שהם עובדים. תהיה משיח, הבנתי. כן, מה אתה אומר? שמחבה כל הערבים ימותו. Right, that's a right-wing fanatical viewpoint that we thought was really only sustained by like a minority of the population. Everybody was like, oh, that's not what people think, but it's actually a viewpoint of the policy makers of the occupation and people who were educated in that setting will hold that belief, right? Because that's all they've ever known. That's what they were taught to believe. That's propaganda. And I can put that video in as well. Yeah. We should end it somehow. <laughs> <laughs> we're ending it by letting our viewers and listeners know that we have set a timer for a year from now so that we can check in with our old pal Abbas. Yeah. To see if he makes good on his threat. His threat. A lot of strongly <laughs> worded letters in this episode. So you many. know, we love a good, we yeah. love a good tisk tisk tisk. We love a good. I'd like to speak to the manager. Zion. Oh, just heavy <laughs> Karens all around. Yeah. That's been another episode of the Palestine Pod. Thank you all so much for listening. Please follow us on Instagram at the Palestine Pod. Go ahead and check out our website with all of our sources at www.palestinepod.com and send us an email at palestinepod at gmail.com. That has been another episode of the Palestine Pod. Thank you all for listening. Have a great day. This is the Palestine Pod. Palestine Pod. Palestine Pod. How do I sound to you? Good. Just don't get, don't like make out with a microphone. You gotta let the mic breathe a little bit. Look, you don't know how attached this mic is to me, right? This <laughs> mic. Oh, feel free to join our Patreon. We would love to see you over there. Okay. I'm naked over there. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not. <laughs> there is no nudity on our Patreon. <laughs> <laughs>